good afternoon, happy Sunday, and welcome to Asia Society. Is anyone here for the first time? First time? Wow, that is like 99% of y'all. Um, I have a little bit of background information about our organization. Asia Societies is an international nonprofit organization, and here at the Texas Center, we offer a variety of programs having to do with art exhibitions, business and policy, education, as well as performing arts and culture. So if you like what you see today and you're interested in finding out what we have in store in the coming months, please feel free to grab a brochure from our front desk after the program. It features a lovely photo of two giant panda cubs taken by Joel Sartori himself at Zoo Atlanta. Um, like y'all probably are, I am also a huge wildlife and conservation person and a big fan of Joel's and the work he's been able to do with Photoark. Um, but before we get the show started, I just have a few housekeeping things to run through. Out of respect for our speaker today, we do ask that you please silence your cell phones and note that no photography or video recording is permitted this afternoon. Um, in case of an emergency, our staff will be here to assist you. Uh, but just in case, please remember that your closest exits are the, sa are the same entrances you came in through the doors of the theater. Um, programs like this would not be possible without your support, the audience's support, as well as the support of Bank of America, the City of Houston through Houston Arts Alliance, the Clayton Fund, Mickey Rosenau and Dr. Ellen Gritz, the Cullen Trust for the Performing Arts, and the Fevro Fund. A big, big thank you also goes to the folks from the Houston Zoo, who are very excited and um, grateful to have been able to collaborate with to bring Joel here to speak today. And now I want to turn the mic over to Mr. Peter Rieger, and um, he's the Vice President of Conservation at the Zoo, so he's going to say a few words. Thank you. Thanks, Ting Ting. I didn't know you were going to make us stand in the middle of the stage and Mark Barrow. So I want to also just say a quick thank you to everybody and thank you to the Asia Society for hosting this conservation forum. This is the third one we've done with the Asia Society. We've had snow leopards, elephants, and now Joel Satori, National Geographic Photographer. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming out today for this very special event. I was going to say a lot about Joel, but I've just spent the past two hours with him and I've forgotten everything that I needed to say. I was going to say he's been on nearly three dozen assignments, but he told me he's only been on 35, so that's not true. Um, I've learned some some of his fears. You know, he flew with the Air Force Thunderbirds and passed out. He wasn't going to tell that story, so I can. Um, so, but he's a great friend to the Houston Zoo. He's a great friend to wildlife. And he's going to talk a little bit today about the photo arc project that he's involved in. He's been with National Geographic for almost 30 years, and he started a program called the Photo Arc, which looks at the biodiversity of what we have on Earth today. And he's photographed over 4,000 individual species, many of which you'll see here in his slide presentation today. So with that, I would like to introduce Joel Sartor. Microphone works. It sounds like it does. Fantastic. Um, well, I'm pleased to be here. I'm especially pleased to be associated with uh, Houston Zoo. They have done more for the photo arc than anybody else. And when I travel someplace to give a talk, it pays for the ARC. I mean, that's, where, that's how I shoot, is I'm self-funding this project largely. So I was able to travel here and speak to you all, and I was able to work at the uh, Houston Zoo this morning and get a few more species in, and then we'll go back tomorrow, and then I fly off to the next place. So I'm very glad to be here. If we can just take the lights down, we'll just start in. We got a lot to talk about today. Um, and I would, I would love it if it's just dark as a coal mine in here, even on me. Even on me. So the number one question I get all the time is, how do you get a, a job with National Geographic? Well, for me, I got a job by, by going to the University of Nebraska, where the N stands for knowledge. That's correct. <laughs> right. The K stands for college. Don't forget about that. And I just took the kind of pictures that I thought were weird or different or interesting or funny. It could be a cowboy roping a cat. It could be the, 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 chicken, the Chippendale dancers. They're, they're supposed to be like the, the Chippendales, but they drink a lot more beer, so. Um, it, could be the, it could be a demolition derby or a guy covered with bees. Um, bad dogs. Bad dogs make really good pictures. 
some dogs are a little worse than others, I guess, right? <laughs> now, of all the pictures in the show today, this is the only one that's not quite what you think. Um, it is, this is my dog, Prairie. I named her in protest. The state of Nebraska declared the prairie dog a pest, so I named her Prairie so I'd have the state's biggest prairie dog. And um, she was very smart, and she would do anything for a milk bone. So I just took a little loop of fishing line that you couldn't see and looped it underneath her lip and pulled it up and then pay her a milk bone and pull it up and pay her a milk bone. So she was cool with that. Um, but in terms of wildlife, you know, I didn't do much in terms of wildlife growing up. I, uh, I just kind of did the things that I thought were different or weird. This is the guy dusting the stuffed sheep in the back of the Cabela's Sporting Goods store <laughs> in Sydney, Nebraska. But what's nice is the Geographic appreciated that and they appreciated the sense of humor. And so that's how I got my job with them, oh, these many years ago. Um, I did, they even let me do a story on Nebraska at one time. And I photographed these twins having lunch. And they remembered this picture from that story. And they put this, these guys on the cover of the December issue. And they said, hey, this was back in September, I think. Why don't you go and see if you can find those guys and photograph them today, 20 years later? You think you could find them? And I said, well, if they're still alive, they eat terribly. Their diet's off. <laughs> so, so I said, I'll try. So I drove out to this little town, Oxford, Nebraska. And this was just a couple months ago. And there they are. <laughs> just the same. Exactly the same. Just the same. Some things never change. I think the grease in the food is a preservative. <laughs> you know Must be. And so I do, I do people's stories sometimes when Geographic asks me. I, uh, I, wanted, I like Garrison Keillor. How many of you guys have heard of Garrison Keillor? He's a, he's a great guy, and he was going to do a story on America's state fairs, and it was written so wonderfully that I couldn't help it. And I thought, well, OK, I'll do a story on state fairs. And I, I did like six fairs in eight weeks. This is a very creepy mother-daughter look-alike contest at <laughs> Iowa. They also have a very good hypnotist act there. And from there, I drove over to um, Indiana. I went all the way to Indiana, drove all night to get their cockroach tractor pull, <laughs> which is kind of a classic. Of, of all the pictures, though, in the state fair story, this one's my favorite. <laughs> This is a radio-fired camera that I had bolted into a cage of a ride called the Slingshot, which is a reverse bungee. It shoots people straight up in the air. And um, what I loved about it was not the picture as much as the fact that the ride owner is a good businessman. And he has a series of loudspeakers or bullhorns around the base of the tower of this thing. And he, and he put a live microphone inside the cage, and he broadcasts the filth and the obscenities people scream. <laughs> And the worse it is, the longer the line, and he doubles the price from 30 bucks to 60 bucks. <laughs> also, you know, as Peter mentioned, I've been gone a long time on the road for Geographic. And you really can't do it unless you have some good support at home. So I thought I'd introduce you to my, my family a little bit. My wife, Kathy, of almost 30 years. Um, I was not in Nebraska when that picture was taken. By the way. <laughs> oh, who else? My grandmother in the nursing home on her 90th birthday. <laughs> We snuck some jack into her. Didn't make a difference, really. Um, uh, daughter Ellen. Um, Ellen taught me, as a sometimes father, because I'm gone a lot, uh, that the camera is a great disciplinary tool. If they're bawling and throwing a fit, you stick a camera in their face, they shape right up. It's great. <laughs> Except for our littlest one, Spencer. He is more of a professional fit thrower. He throws. <laughs> He throws fits in the way a, a potter would work with clay or a painter would work in oil. I mean, like, throwing a fit at home, don't even waste his time. That's beneath him. That's just something that he just does just to keep sharp, you know? He really wants to take it on the road and really, really show off what he has on vacation. Could be Easter, Easter Sunday, too, doesn't it? He's really professional. He's a true professional. So, the other question I get all the time in the Q&A session, and we'll have time for questions afterwards, I get this question, have you ever come close to getting killed on assignment? And one lady asked me if I ever had been killed on assignment. <laughs> Not quite yet, yeah, but you know, I've, I've done stories where I'm, you know, basically in, inside a, inside a uh, truck where the, the thing won't start and the bear's trying to figure out how to peel the doors open for an hour, and that's very nerve-wracking. I mean, it's, it's different than if you're at a, at a zoo where everything's pretty and fluffy. Polar bears in the wild, I mean, they're hungry. They're hungry. They're not malicious. They're just hungry. And we look slow to them. Of course we do. Um, 
you know, I've had, you know, various animals chase me over the years and bite, bite holes completely through my underwater housing. That's kind of expected, I guess. But so far, the only thing I've been bitten by, believe it or not, is bugs. Lots and lots of bugs. So you're looking at the feet of a very desperate photographer who had not made a good picture in three days. <laughs> the thing with geographic assignments is you're only as good as your last story, and they cannot publish your excuses instead of a present story. You must produce great results. So, so for a story on the North Slope, I was really, really desperate. Three days is a long time to go without getting a picture, and I wanted to show the insect load up there, so I just took off my shoes and socks. And I remember my feet itched for about three days. But this is the one that ran in the magazine, of course. This is, the, this is one of the big pictures they used. And I got a coupon for a free pedicure from a reader, too. <laughs> I didn't think my feet looked that bad. But. So we do these stories, and we hope, we hope, I hope, most of us that work for Geographic, we hope we can make the world a, a better place. We call that moving the needle. We want to change public opinion by just educating. We don't want you to, we don't want to tell you what to think, but we do want to get you to think. How many of you guys get National Geographic magazine? Wow, educated crowd. That's great. That's far higher than normal, I see. So, so we do a story, let's say, on the Gulf spill. And it's disappointing in the response we got from the American public. I mean, people had seen the pipe camera spewing that junk live on CNN. Remember that for weeks? That they had a camera on the pipe just spewing that stuff. And it was a terrible thing. And I thought, for sure, this is going to awaken a new enviro environmental consciousness in America. But it failed to do so. The price of the pump didn't change. These birds and, birds and shrimp and fish were all very far away from us, I guess. And we felt bad for the Cajun people that might have missed out on making a living fishing. But you know, that's OK. We move on, right? Well, it's not OK to me. I mean, we're drilling there as big as can be. But it doesn't stop me. It just inspires me. I don't get mad. I'm not mad at anybody. I'm just thinking, how can we get people interested? We have to make things more interesting than depressing. If we fail to do that, we will lose people. How fast can you click the button at night when you're watching TV and you see those starving African kids come on? They're covered in flies. Change the channel as fast as you can, right? Well, people just change the channel on that oil spill. That's the problem. We have to make it interesting. If we're doing a story on migrations, let's say animal migrations in North America, this mountain goat's migrating vertically to get salt. Every step could be its last. Very, very careful about where they step. That's interesting, OK? We lead people into our stories with interesting stuff. Then we maybe hit them with the depressing stuff. But we can't do a whole story on depressing. <laughs> people won't tolerate a whole story on depressing. So migrations, how does this affect migrations? Well, these turbine fields, they don't throw off carbon. So that's great. Once you manufacture it, get it into the ground, get it spinning, it doesn't throw off carbon. But boy, you know, it's, it's, it's calamitous. It's catastrophic, we could say, for things that fly. And uh, that's birds and bats. We need birds and bats. We really do. Beyond just being interesting things and beautiful to be around, we need them. And each turbine kills an average of 32 bats and five birds a year in the one study site I went to in Pennsylvania. But then I hear something last week, that birds hitting buildings, glass buildings, makes this look trivial. Birds getting hit by feral cats, killed by cats walking around. If you've got an outdoor cat, cut it out. Put it inside. Put it inside, seriously. Birds getting hit by cats, birds hitting glass. These things make wind turbine take trivial, trivial. So really, what I'm asking you to do today, please, is keep an open mind with me. I go out on these assignments, I have an open mind. Kids, having an open mind throughout your life will make you money, it'll get you a better mate, and you'll enjoy life more. Rather than thinking, nope, that's the way it is, hence. <laughs> I'm going to stay like this no matter what new information I get. This is what I believe. This is what my parents taught me to believe. And I'm going to stay like this in a little bitty circle, defending that no matter what. I'm telling you, keep an open mind. It's a better way to live. And boy, is the world changing quickly. You better be able to think on your feet. You better be able to turn on a dime. Let's talk about this. This is right by my home in Lincoln, Nebraska. It's cornfields. How does cornfield affect migration? I shot this for the same migration story. How does that affect migrations? Well. Monarchs, down they go, down they go. Corn went to seven, almost eight dollars a bushel a couple years ago, and all the farmers remember that. Don't blame Roundup, the chemical that kills milkweed, which they have to have. 
blame the fact that we're so good at taking every inch for corn and beans from ditch to ditch, road to road, acre, mile after mile. We haven't left any place for these monarchs to go and feed on nectar-bearing plants and get to the milkweed that they need to lay their eggs. We've really, really cleaned the clock of the Great Plains where these butterflies migrate up, and so we might lose the fabulous monarch migration outside of Mexico City soon. These are things that are interesting to me and I think interesting to our readership, and I think people would want to help. If you want to help, you want to help these guys, plant native plants. Plant native plants right here in Houston. Turn part of your backyard into a prairie. Believe, believe it, it's easier than mowing it all the time, isn't it? More fun, too. What else for migrations? No matter what you think of the border wall politically, it's tough on wildlife. The first step to extinction is genetic isolation, isn't it? So if you've got this big wall up, you think that, that bobcat can call his buddies and say, hey, there's a break at mile 72, you can get through there? No, they're isolated. And so down go ocelots and bobcats and tortoises, things that cannot get over that wall by flying over. They're really stuck. That's a tough thing. It's a tough thing. Um, what else? I wanted to show the fact that barbed wire fencing is actually an impediment to migration by showing pronghorn antelope. They would rather crawl under fence than jump over for some reason. And so I found some low spots along a fence line up in uh, Alberta, Canada. We ran 10 traps. Uh, still traps. Anytime anything moves in front of it, there's a little bitty device right there, right there. Anytime anything moves in front of it, the camera will take a picture. And so we ran these things for months and we got about 11,000 pictures of tumbleweeds blowing in the wind. <laughs> Fantastic tumbleweed pictures, but that's not really going to do it. So eventually, <laughs> Eventually, of course, we ran them and ran them and ran them uh, through the turn of the year, and we got a frame or two that we liked where we're right close to the animals, right in their lap. That's the way the public needs to see things now that planet Earth has come and gone. It's raised the bar. We need to be right with the animals, seeing natural behavior. And what I love is National Geographic reaches about 40 million people a month, and in the caption, we can say this. Look, Mr. Rancher, if you've got to replace some fence, move the bottom strand up from 12 inches up to 18 inches and make it smooth. The calves can get through once in a while, they'll go back to mom, though. This is really a good thing. It helps pronghorn get through there without carving their backs up on barbs. It's a good thing. That's a common sense solution. I'm finding common sense is really where it's at. That's an easy thing for people to buy into. It's not politically offensive, it's okay. So each of the stories that I do, they follow a bit of a formula, if you will. We try to get people hooked on things that are weird or interesting or different, like for a story on koalas, and then we hit them with a serious thing or something where we can learn. Uh, koalas, weird, interesting, I guess so. <laughs> I guess so, I don't know. Um, these are weird and kind of cute, see, but they're not cute if you understand how these babies came to be with these human mothers. Well, these babies came to be with these human mothers because mama koala is long gone, and so there's a there's a bunch of babies that need adopted, and they're as needy as a human infant. And so these human mothers have to care for these koalas. There's a whole league of them. Why is that? Well, north of Brisbane, for example, this is where the koalas live, you know, on the 9th and 10th fairway at a golf course. And when they get down out of the, out of the trees on the golf course because they've got to find better food or mates or, or just spread out, they get trapped in these suburbs, and they get hit by cars, and they especially get whacked by dogs. Domestic dogs, they've got no protection against them. This koala had been bitten into. And we do our homework when we work for National Geographic. We never want to hear, you should have been here last month. We never want to hear that. So we do our homework, and I knew before I ever left that I would be able to make this picture. And this is one week's worth of dead koalas, all killed by dogs, including that, that mom and baby right there. The nurses at one koala hospital were so outraged that the government of Australia would not provide the animal uh, with an imperiled listing which would protect some habitat in northern Australia now. The southern one's doing okay still. Uh, they saved these koalas for me in a freezer until I could get there. One week's worth of koalas, and this picture ran around the world. And in this case, unlike the oil spill story, this actually moved the needle, we think, because the government of, Austra of Australia about three, four weeks after this ran, they did de de declare the northern koalas imperiled. So that's a nice thing. That's a good thing. Um, same type of thing, though. Every time I take a geographic assignment, I think, okay, this is going to be a lot of work, but how is it going to be worthwhile? Can we move the needle? For a story on the Albertine Rift in Uganda, we're looking at elephants and elephant dung. We're looking, again, weird, interesting, different, 
anything it takes <laughs> to get people to look and to tune into the story and to follow along and to get to turn in the pages. We ran camera chaps at, at watering holes and on carcasses and, and on uh, hyena dens at night using infrared so the hyena never even saw any visible light when we shot this. And we went to Buendi and Penetrol Forest and, and went searching for the mountain gorillas. And when we found them, one was asleep with his foot kind of drifting through the, through the ferns. That's his foot, not his hand. We do all this so that we can get a little bit of message in there. Again, we can't have a whole story of messaging because the public won't tolerate that. But we can slip things in with all these other sexy pictures around. We can tell the story of Uganda, which is this. 35, 36 million people there now. 34 million when I was there a few years ago. Everything on the left, that's private land that's being developed, being cultivated. Everything on the right is Queen Elizabeth National Park. So, of course, the cattlemen push their cows into the park every day. They don't have a choice. There's lots of grass there. But the problem is they have lions still. Well, not for long if the cattlemen can help it because they find the, they find the vultures in the morning, go right to the carcass because of the vultures, pour furidan over it, which is an odorless, tasteless pesticide that kills everything that comes back to eat that carcass that night, even the flies. So that's bad. The solution? The solution is to go see the lions and hire the cattlemen to take you to see live lions. Only when these lions are worth more alive than dead shall they be saved. Same can be said for hyenas and leopards over there. And this strategy is actually working. A man named Ludwig Seifert, who's a German, basically, biologist, he has started that type of an ecotourism business there, and it's working. He's taking former lion killers and turning them into lion guides. And those lion guides, believe it or not, they're not going to let anybody in the village take their livelihood from them. They're not going to let anybody kill lions. So that is smart and working. That's working. So, I had been around the world over and over and over again, so much it'd make your head spin for many, many years. And then my wife got breast cancer. And I was home for a year. I was grounded. For the first time in my career, I was grounded, meaning I couldn't go anywhere. And we had three kids at home. The youngest was two. So she was very sick, and I, and I didn't know what to do. I found out very quickly that, that um, <laughs> it's tough being a, being a parent. It's very time consuming. I remember going to her saying, Kathy, you've, you've got to get better. I mean, she's like, <laughs> she's like, well, thank you. I love you too. I said, no, 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 no. I cannot raise these kids by myself. You have to get better. This is rough. And so she did get better and she's fine today. And that's been almost 10 years ago. But in that year I had at home to think, I had a long time to think. I worried about a lot of things, whether we'd make a living, whether we could keep our house, all that. But I also have thought about good stuff. I thought about the work of John, John James Audubon, who had painted the birds for the better part of his life, and then he finished by painting the mammals. And his descriptions of the behavior, as well as his paintings, of many species that are extinct now, including all these birds you're seeing, are the only good ones that we have today. And I thought, what a noble cause. I know he was doing it because he loved it and he wanted to make a living, but what a good cause. What a grand thing that he did for all of us, for, the future, gen for future generations. He knew a lot of these species wouldn't make it, like the passenger pigeon and the great auk. He knew it, ivoryville woodpecker. He could see it coming. And then I thought about Edward Curtis, who was a photographer back when photography was very young, 1890s through 1910, 1920. He got a grant from Rockefeller, and Rockefeller specified, here's 75 grand, which was a bunch of money back then. You can't keep a penny of it for yourself, Edward, but you can hire linguists, you can hire filmmakers, you can buy plenty of supplies for your view camera, and you can go record these tribal cultures that you can see are going to be wiped out, or nearly so, by European settlement. And so Curtis did. And again, these are the only good photographs we have of what people were like back, back then and their dances and their ceremonies. And I thought that was remarkable. So on the days when Kathy finally started to feel good again, I would go out and th think, OK, I'm going to try to be Audubon. Let's photograph birds very close in the habitat they require. Let's try to get people hooked on animals that way. Let's get them to care that way. Well, maybe. What I learned, though, is that each of these pictures took about 50 hours to do with a radio-triggered camera looking through a spotting scope. I thought, wow. I do not have that many years left in me. I can't do that. <laughs> so then I thought, you know, uh, how about if I do this? Let's show endangered species and let's show cause and effect in a single frame. Surely that will move people to care about animals 
that are not doing very well, like the Alabama beach mouse. He does fine between the houses as long as he can have some grass covered dunes to live in and eat seeds and grasses. He doesn't do too well when there's a 10 acre condo parking lot marching his way. Uh, the gopher, gopher tortoise near Mobile Bay, they do great in pine forests, uh, provided that you don't cut the woods down, provided that you don't build a highway through the middle of their sanctuary. Tortoises and highways don't mix very well. Or their northern spotted owl, they do pretty well if you don't cut all the woods down. And then I thought, ah, these are too complicated. These require people to read captions. I can't count on that. Uh, you know, I just can't count on that. Most people are busy. We have to hit them in a more interesting way than that. And so as I, as I went forward in time, I started taking, and I started going on the road again, I started taking backgrounds with me. The Atwater's Prairie Chicken from near, uh, on both sides of Houston actually, looks better on black velvet than out in the field maybe with studio lighting. This ocelot, perhaps he looks a little bit better up close. Maybe, right? Or this drill that was gonna be turned into stew at a bushmeat market in Equatorial Guinea. I brought black velvet along, made him immortal. And so when I finally got back on the road, actually what I did, my first story was on amphibian decline. And uh, I was very concerned about amphibians because of a fungus that's sweeping the world that's really taking its toll called chytrid fungus. They're also susceptible to climate change. They're susceptible to pollution. Um, they're, very, they're very fragile creatures, and yet this class of animals has been with us for millions of years. And I think they're fascinating, and Geographic allowed me to, to do a story in that manner photo arc manner. This is the terrible poison dart frog. Drop for drop, one of the most toxic things you can possibly imagine. If you have a cut on your hand in the wild and touch it, you'll die. That simple. Wow, that's pretty amazing. But all of them are pretty amazing. I would hope that we wouldn't lose any of them. That's the goal, is to get the general public to care enough and to realize that when frogs go extinct, you'll notice. I love this, from the Vancouver Aquarium. She's covered in insects. You know, but you can't help but think there is some urgency here, folks. It will affect you. It will. I mean, this animal's down to nine in Ecuador and five. And this was from, this was from just three weeks ago in Panama. This animal will go extinct. It's down to just three individuals and they can't get them to breed. That's a male there on the left and a female. Or this, this frog down to just two males. Or, or maybe even this one, this is at the Atlanta Botanical Gardens. This is the little rab's fringed limb tree frog. By little, he's actually pretty big for a frog, almost the size of my fifth. The very last one, a male. So when he goes away, that's it. That species is extinct. And you think, well, how does a frog affect me? I don't know. I don't know. But we're on track to lose 50% of all species by 2100. Surely, in those 50% of species going away, that will really come back to haunt us. And indeed, in the 10 years almost that I've been doing what I call the photo arc, this project, this has gone extinct. And this, and this, and this, and this. And I think, what do I got to do to get people to care about things that are not polar bears and tigers? What do I got to do? Like this aquatic roly-poly bug the size of my pinky nail that now lives just in this little hot springs outside of Socorro, New Mexico. What do I got to do? Well, I think it starts, again, with bringing them in with fun, interesting, lively things. Animals that we have saved. The panda is completely saved now. Completely. I mean, they're not in any danger of going extinction right, extinct right now. And there are many species just from North America that got down to fewer than two dozen individuals. And they have been saved. But what it took were people of vision that understood that they were in peril and they needed some help. Captive breeding helped all of these animals. You have to learn about something and know it exists before you'll be moved to save it. So the photo arc was born, I guess. Why the black and white backgrounds? Well, a bison is no more important than a mouse. And this polar bear is on equal footing as a bog turtle, let's say. All have equal weight and grace and style and importance. I eventually did a book for the Geographic uh, called Rare. And we changed the name to the photo arc. And we just have been starting in as many different species as we can possibly get. By we, I mean I. If I get whacked early, my son says he'll take over for me, like Audubon's kid did when Audubon became adult-minded towards the end. That's fine. And most of the time, people respond well to these types of pictures, the biggies. 
But the photo arc really, really is about doing the least among us. <laughs> the creatures that you'll never meet, that you'll never see, that will never have a voice unless I give it to them. Most of the world has no idea that oblong winged katydids, for example, come in a myriad of colors. Every few thousand eggs, one hatches out pink or yellow. Can you believe that? Or even orange. But birds see those immediately and eat them. They're from, they're from the center of the US. Birds see the, the ones that aren't green immediately and eat them up. Well, if they're bred in captivity, they don't. And that's a great way to get people interested. But how do we get people interested in something like clams? Freshwater mussels. I pose them with their, the backs of their shells to make them look like they have sad faces. I don't know. Or squid. Or maybe, maybe it's fun facts about animals. Like this is a remora. You know those fish that are always sucking onto the sides of sharks and getting a free ride? That, is, that sucker on the head is actually a dorsal fin that has slid forward through evolutionary time and, and cause, allows it to get, get a free ride and whatever slop comes out of the shark's mouth. It can feed on that. What's remarkable is that there are so many life forms filling every niche around the planet that whatever the habitat is, it is absolutely full of wildlife. That's what the photo arc seeks to do. The more animals I can get standing up on their hind legs, the better. I'm told I have a psychologist doing a doctoral project up in Canada who has written me with his survey results saying, photograph every animal you can up on its hind legs because that's what people view with respect. If it's on all fours, it means it's food. You need to photograph everything standing up, Joel. Well, it's a hard, that's a hard thing to do. A Malayan taper doesn't walk around on its hind legs too often, or African painted dogs. What I'm finding now, though, really, believe it or not, is that zoos are the arcs. Going in forward in time, from this day on, what you see in zoos sometimes is all that's left. And that is a remarkable thing. You want to know how to save the, save the kingdom? Go to the Houston Zoo. Spend your money. If you care about wildlife and you're not a zoo member, you're just hot air. You're just kidding. I don't believe you. Become a member. Go there. Spend money. Buy snacks, treats, books, whatever. Get there. They do endangered species breeding and, and, and husbandry every day at the Houston Zoo. It's a great organization, fantastic organization. The last story I did for Geographic actually ran in their 125th anniversary issue. Um, on, basically, it was devoted to photographers with a mission, which I was honored to be a part of. I went first to Ocean Park in Hong Kong, where they have plexiglass floors that king penguins swim around under your feet which is quite remarkable. They also perfected a technique to anesthetize fish to do surgery on fish. Prize koi in this case. Um, believe it or not, most people go there, if they're from mainland China, they go there to see the, the dolphin show. That is the thing. And, and when they go up there, the sea lions start the act, and then they go into the dolphins. And most people, this is the, if they're from mainland China, this is the only time they're going to get any environmental messaging. And Ocean Park does a pretty good job about that. Even when you're leaving at the end of the day, they project a nature show on the side of a fountain, which is really remarkable and very, very subtle in how it tries to get people to know that their consumption, how they live their lives, does affect species. From there, I went to Oppenhul, which is a primate park in the Netherlands. You couldn't do this in the US, could you? Have the monkeys running loose? <laughs> They're a little less litigious over there in Holland, I have this feeling. The monkeys crawl over the kids going through their backpacks and the, trying, to get, trying to get trinkets. Most of the time, though, I worked here in the US with, uh, with the zoos that were doing interesting things as much as I could. And the geographic has been so supportive, they realize that if, you take, if a guy like me takes a story on zoos of the world, he's going to shoot photo arc portraits everywhere he goes, no matter what. So uh, I thought it was interesting that many zoos are, are getting away with, from close contact with elephants and they do protected contacts. There's still a couple of zoos that are hands-on, but for safety reasons they've gone to protected contact. Um, working on snow leopard babies or maybe going down to the, um, down, back down to New Orleans to the Audubon Zoo and seeing how these dedicated women raise baby Mississippi Sandhill cranes from the time they hatch, these babies never hear a human voice or see a human face. They raise them wearing these costumes to make the babies think they were reared by adults. How to find food, watch out for predators from above. Went to the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo and checked out their zebra herd, which is one of the largest in the country. Of course, I had to go to the Houston Zoo on New Year's Day 
to see this guy crawling through. He, I think he was still a bit intoxicated from New Year's Eve, <laughs> crawling through the piranha tank through this tube. He was still wearing his white jacket from the night before. <laughs> Columbus Zoo has this amazing polar bear exhibit. And I showed you this picture earlier. This one actually ran. Um, from there, I went on down to the Georgia Aquarium to see how the whale sharks get fed out of rowboats. And I set up a, uh, I set up a remote fired camera, again with the remote fired camera inside, inside a steel case to show the perspective of an animal on display with the crowds looking at him, a tiger. We could not get the tiger in front of the camera until we sprayed perfume on the housing. And then he rolled all over right in front of it. They use perfume in that tiger's exhibit routinely to give him enrichment so he'll wander around. And this is, a, I ended the story with a mountain tape here that's at the LA Zoo. There aren't enough really to keep them going in captivity. And so that's one that zoos may, may let go by the wayside. Nobody really knows how they're doing in the wild. So do the animals like it? Well, sometimes. Sometimes they like being part of the process. They help me edit a little bit. And sometimes they just want to get out of there. These mice are planning their escape out of my little <laughs> shooting tent. So I did a little video to show you behind the scenes some of the things that can go wrong. Well, some of them don't like it very much. Thanks. Thanks. But we work with zoos a long time before I go and speak in an area. We talk with the, with the zookeepers like, like Chris Holmes, who's curator of birds at, at Houston. He and I have worked a lot together. And, um, and we figure out, well, which, which birds would be good candidates? We put them in a big tent. Sometimes it takes a lot of people to wrangle. But you know, it's, uh, it's worth it. They're beautiful, and it just takes a few minutes, and everybody's you know no worse for the wear. Um, birds to me, I think, are birds to me are amazing in that they they communicate well, and they're gorgeous, and they're they're sometimes they're real showstoppers, and they they um, they're out of this world, and they're and best of all, they can fly a lot of them. So that's remarkable. I want to try to get all that I can, but it's kind of a race now because it's harder and harder for zoos to get animals from the wild if they don't breed in captivity. It's tougher and tougher. Um, it's hard to get animals out of Asia anymore because of bird flu scare. And so it's a bit of a race to get around to these zoos in time before they don't have a lot of these animals in their inventory. But you know, I was, I was talking about the need to keep things interesting and fun. Otherwise, people will tune out. We're starting to do little videos now to try to do just that. 30 seconds is about all we want to do, just short little attention grabbers.
So, so we figure if we do that enough, eventually something will go viral, right? Something will go viral. Or maybe just good storytelling. I'm, a, I'm hopelessly uh, romantic about good storytelling saving the world. Like, like this couple, this is Don Butler and his wife Anne, and they are in Clinton, North Carolina, and they have been breeding rare pheasants for a long time. They supply a lot of zoos with rare pheasants. And um, I went there and spent a couple days with them. I got nine different species I didn't get before, and what was remarkable to me is Don was looking at the back of my camera as we're photographing these birds in a tent, and they're in there, and they're cool. They're just hanging out. They can't see us. They're in this cloth tent. And he's looking at this, and he says, I'm so glad you're here, Joel. There are no good pictures of this bird anywhere. He said it over and over again. I'm thinking, wow, what do you mean there's no good pictures of this bird? He said, there just, there just aren't. Delacour pheasant, there just aren't any good pictures. Or Himalayan, Himalayan fowl like this, there just aren't. And I'm thinking, wow, if there are no good pictures of these birds, birds that look like Las Vegas showgirls, <laughs> is there any hope that anybody will ever pay attention or give a voice to some little mouse or rat or snail or snake or turtle or toad? No. This is it. And so off I go. And one thing Don said, he kind of challenged me, he laid down the gauntlet. He said, Joel, um, by the way, if you, get, if you ever get to India, there's a bird called the Western Tragopan. There are no photos of that bird. I dare you. So I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> so I, what do you know? Three months later, I got invited to go speak at the World Zoo and Aquarium Association conference in New Delhi. And I hired an assistant. We went 22 hours by train and five hours by car over these terrible roads that are just terrifying. And we got the bird. There he is. There he is. So, and while we were there, of course, you know, spent another three weeks just going around and getting other Indian species that people really didn't have good, high quality pictures of, including this turtle that colors up for breeding season. He looks like he's got an American flag on the back of his head, or the four horned antelope, or the golden langer. Um, this was one of the interesting ones. This is, a, uh, this is an, an Indian leopard who had, who had hunted and killed and eaten six toddlers off of playgrounds in Bombay. And they didn't euthanize her. And I said, wow, that's remarkable. He said, yeah, you know, here, Joel, if we killed every leopard that ate people, we would have no leopards left in India. So we're more tolerant than you would expect. So I'm like, OK, I got that. And then. Houston Zoo last year sponsored a trip to Vietnam where we were able to go uh, to the far north of the country to Cook Farm National Park and go to a pangolin center. Pangolins are in real trouble now. They're consumed voraciously by people. Most of these animals, obviously, people are affecting them. We got two different types of civets there at the same center. And we walked across the road. There are three centers right by each other there. And we got really rare tortoises. And the, this one was so important. It's the Asian giant flat shell turtle, soft shell turtle, they drained the little pond he was in, it's a little cement bottom pond, to get him out and show him to us. They said, we really want you to get a picture of this guy because they've quit showing up in confiscations. That's how they get their animals. They're confiscated from wildlife smugglers. You know what it means when something quits showing up in confiscations, you guys? It means that it does not really exist in any real sense in the wild anymore. And so who's going to keep this thing as a pet or show it off at a zoo? Nobody these guys. So it's an honor to be able to do this work. Uh, we next went to a place, the last place we went to was, a, was the Endangered Primate Rescue Center run by Tilo Nadler, who's a good friend of the Houston Zoo as well. And uh, he'd, I'd met him at a conference uh, in, in Des Moines, Iowa, and he says in his thick German accent, you come over, we catch them. So he had this transfer cage. And he'd bring, these, he'd bring these primates out that were just amazing looking, that nobody else has. He has nine species of primate there that nobody else has, nobody else in captivity. And he single-handedly, he's the guy with his thumb in the dike. You ever hear that story? I had to judge a photo contest in Holland, and I was there for two weeks. And I asked him about that story a couple times. I said some kid that Holland's a very low-lying country, and every town has a dam above it holding back water. At least it did. And this kid at dusk saw a leak in a dike, and he put his hand into it to stop it. And he stayed there all night and saved his town. Telos like that. The butlers are like that. They are. The zoos are like that. They're basically putting their hand on the dike, and they're saying, we can see how this is headed in a world that's going to have 10 or 11 billion people. We can see where this is going, but not on our watch. We're going to do everything we can to save species on our watch. 
And so it is with the photo arc, I guess you could say. The more I shoot, the more the odds are that somebody of wealth or passion or both will get hooked and want to know what is driving that species to extinction? What can I do to help? See, there's never been a better time to actually care about this stuff and, and affect real change. You know why? Because there's a lot of species on the run. And we know exactly what it takes to save many of them. And the good news is 90% of what you're seeing, 90% could be saved. It just takes people with passion and drive. Wealth helps too. That helps too. These guys are, of course, shot at the Houston Zoo right here, photographed here. You notice there's no chimps in the show, though. Here's why there are no chimps. What do you think? Does that look pretty good? I can just hope. They're pretty strong. I hear they really? could rip your, rip your uh, arm off and beat it. Beat right. you to death. Exactly. If you don't believe it yet first, it'll beat you in half. So now, doesn't this look nice? Doesn't this look nice? Perfect. It's perfect for chimps. How long will that last? 60 seconds? I don't happen to think it's that funny, but... You know, they, throw, they threw their poop at me when I got done with the shoot, too, which is sad. So, you know, entertainment, that's what it's got to be. We've got to make this stuff, we've got to make conservation interesting and fun and competitive with everything else. What can we do? Well, to me, these things are amazing, how they sound and how they move. They're all worth preserving. They're all interesting. So we're starting to do more little videos, more things set to music, whatever it takes. So how are the pictures used? The pictures are used any way we can absolutely think up. They run in National Geographic routinely. They run on the covers of, of different nonprofit organization publications, anti-palm oil campaigns. They run on zoo websites. They run in anti-extinction campaigns. We give away all this work to the zoos free of charge. It's a terrible marketing plan, actually, but <laughs> that's OK. Uh, and, and the zoos make good use of the pictures. They really do. Uh, they could go on the sides of trolley cars in Australia or in the anti-ivory campaign that's running in airports around the world. Houston Zoo's taken big advantage of the pictures, which is great because they've been really amazing sponsors, all the way from their admission tickets to the sides of their new education center. But what I really like is when the photo arc truly moves the needle in a measurable way. Um, some friends of mine in the Fish and Wildlife Service called and said, look, there's a, there's a bird that's the rarest in the US, the Florida grasshopper sparrow. Come down and cover it. Because the Fish and Wildlife Service said, we're going to we'll devote 20,000 to 30,000 a year now just documenting its extinction. It's down to a couple hundred pairs. We're going to let this one go. So I went down, covered it. 
was put on the cover of Audubon magazine. Ted Williams wrote a very poignant story about it. And I actually got a letter from Fish and Wildlife Service that said, hey, thanks to the photo arc, we're going to put $1.3 million into it this year for a captive breeding center, which is great. I mean, let's see if it works. It's really late for the bird, but really measurable success is what this project is all about. And also another thing that was just kind of fun was the Climate Change Summit happened in New York City at the United Nations last September. And uh, there's a new movie coming out called The Sixth Extinction that the photo arc's part of for a few minutes. And they used photo arc pictures and put them all over the outside of the United Nations. just allow all these amazing creatures to vanish. But it would be very little use in me or anybody else exerting all this energy to save the wild places if people are not being educated into being better stewards than we be. If we all lose hope, there is no hope. There's still a lot left that's worth fighting for. So how can we, those of us sitting here today, besides becoming members of the Houston Zoo, which I know you'll all do as soon as we're out for the day here, how can we affect change in our daily lives? Well, I'm going to use daughter Ellen here again, who I'm going to call an iPod idiot for the point of this show. <laughs> we're going to talk about the fact that if we just listen to Justin Bieber over and over and over again, it's probably not going to make you a better steward, as Jane Goodall was saying. How do we become a better steward if we're afraid to get more than 10 feet away from an electrical outlet, if we're afraid to get outside? Well, this is true. Parents need to encourage their kids to learn. But most kids know, most kids know that many species are in trouble and that there are ways of doing things differently than we've done before. For example, solar power is, is not a magic bullet for everything, but this one solar array outside Las Vegas powers 14,000 homes with every, every appliance running they've got. 14,000 homes for one solar array. Now the solar array is two miles long and a half mile wide, and they have to pour plasticizer over the desert floor to keep the dust from coming up. But it is something, and it doesn't put carbon into the air. What else? Watch the kind of vehicle you drive. Ellen hates big vehicles, likes my Prius. She says, better yet, walk, ride your bike. Ellen knows that recycling, again, it's not all in one. It's not the magic bullet, but it helps. It helps to reduce energy consumption, certainly in raw material extraction, if we recycle. And energy efficiency, insulating your home well, using the right light bulbs, that's a big deal. That's a real thing. That's real. And by the way, folks, being green makes you money. It saves you money being green. It's a good thing. What else? Eating well, eating less meat, eating seasonally, buying produce locally. That's a great thing. It's an excellent thing. It's better for your local economy, tastes better, probably organic, better for you. What else? Well, we, we ripped out our lawn and we put in a no water fescue. We don't pour any chemicals on there, of course, because those all end up in the groundwater or downstream somewhere. But we don't even water our lawn anymore. You water to get it established, then you never water it again. When it's dry in the summer, it goes brown. When it's wet out, it goes green. It's excellent. And I don't have to mow my lawn nearly as much, which is good. But the biggie, the biggie, this is Ellen's room after she cleaned it for the picture, by the way. <laughs> the biggie is this. How do you spend your money? How do you spend your money? You do not have to wait for an election year to vote. And kids, you don't even need to be 21. Every time you spend your money, you are saying to a retailer, 
I approve of what this is made of and I want you to do it again and again. That is the power to change the world right there. You're going to use your money for good or for evil. Learn what the products you buy are made from and how far away they're made. What's that dining room set made of? What's the bedroom set made of? Is it made of really dark hard wood? Well, if it's not walnut, odds are, or oak, it might have come from a tropical forest somewhere. You don't want to hurry along deforestation because you want to have a bedroom set, right? Think about what you're buying. What else? Getting kids out. Getting them muddy. That's a huge deal. And going to places where they're good stewards already and they're planting prairie back where, let's say, let's say only crops were. That's a good thing. We bought a little farm. We're doing just that. And even Spencer the fit thrower will go out with his dad and fish a little bit once in a while, which is nice. Mandating environmental education in schools and making sure that, again, we keep it interesting. We keep it competitive with all the junk that's on every other media application that you can find. Look, on, on any given Saturday in the fall from my front lawn, I hear this tremendous roar coming at me. I'm two and a half miles away from this building, but I hear 100,000 people nearly screaming at the tops of their lungs <laughs> for a football team. And I think, holy cow. If I could get that many people to care that passionately about something that actually mattered, the future of life on Earth, <laughs> could we make a dent? Could we change the world? Yes, we could. We could change the world. Absolutely, we could change the world. It takes thought, and it takes awareness. It just takes a little education as to what's out there. And I think people will do the right thing. I think people do care. I think you guys care. That's why you're here. You're smart folks. I think you care. I think you probably care as much as I do. You just don't know what to do about it. You get depressed. Oh, I can't save the whole world. It's so depressing. I'm just not going to do a thing. You get depressed. Well, I'm telling you, don't get depressed and don't try to save the whole world, but save your corner of the world. Your corner of the world. That's enough. That's plenty. In your declining hours, in your final hours, you look in the mirror. You want to see a hero. You want to see somebody that tried to do the best they could. And I believe all of us is capable of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be a photo arc scale project. But since we're talking among friends, this project right now, we're at, we'll be at 5,000 of the world's 12,000 captive species by the turn of the year. The goal is to get 12,000 species, every captive species around the world, before I die. I'm 52. Tick, 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 tick. <laughs> so what I want to say is this. If you see something here that moves you, great. I, never, I usually never say this, but help us out. I'm self-funding this project. And that doesn't just mean cash, although that's fantastic. And the Houston Zoo has set up a donation page. So your contribution is tax deductible through the Houston Zoo's website. Come talk to me if you're interested. But your thoughts, your spirit, your energy, Tell people to follow the photo, photo arc on Instagram. That's the coin of the realm. It's having a lot of social media following. Follow us on Instagram. If you see a better way of doing this, if you hear something that I say that was a turn off, if you think of something I should be shooting, if you've got artistic talents that you think could help make this sing, if you're a video editor, if you're a music person, if you can think of any way to help the arc, it's just me and my little staff of four people back home in Lincoln, Nebraska, and we're peddling as fast as we can. We could use your help. And if nothing else, tell people to like us on Facebook. All right? That's all there is to it. And when I get down or bummed about things, you know, it doesn't last. It never lasts, ever. It just inspires me to keep going. And the one thing I think about routinely is this quote from Margaret Mead. Always, always. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thanks so much, folks. Time for questions. Does <laughs> anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. That's a good question. Does ecotourism damage the environment? Do I know how it damages the environment? Uh, I think the damage is minimal compared to what's going on with bulldozers right now around the world and chainsaws. I think that if we give people a reason to go to see the lemurs in Madagascar, that truly is why the woods will be saved. If you've got 
people coming in wanting to spend money to hire guides, stay in local hotels. I saw it firsthand with the mountain gorillas. Mountain gorillas are not completely out of the woods, but they certainly wouldn't be around today if they weren't worth so much money each to view, for sure. So I don't, I don't know. I'm sure you could find examples of ecotourism damaging soil somewhere or threatening birds off nests. But I think that it is the best alternative at this point with so many of us. Go out and see the stuff. Antarctica, fabulous. Galapagos, fabulous. Go see this stuff. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. How long has a photo art been going on? And can we see certain glimpses of it now on Instagram? Or can we see it on Facebook? Or do we have to wait until later? Yeah, how long has the photo art been going on? About 10 years. We're at five, we'll be at 5,000 species soon. Out of the world's 12,000, the goal is to get every captive species on Earth. That's the goal. And yes, you can see it. You can see it on my site, Joel Sartori. You can see it on the geographic site. You can see it on photoarc.com. You can see it on Instagram. You can see it on Facebook. If you look at PhotoArc on Google, up it comes. That's right. But truly, the number of Instagram users or people that follow us on Instagram, that is the coin of the realm. If we ever want to attract a real sponsor, I'm told we got to up that number. We got 17,000 or so now. That's not enough. We need to have hundreds of thousands of followers. So who else? Yes. I have met Jane Goodall a couple times, and she is a nice lady. She's exactly what you would expect. She's great. Mother Nature herself. She's a fantastic person. <laughs> Who else? Yes. Do you include fish? I do include fish. There were a couple fish in there, but not much. But there are a lot of fish species. There are a lot. There are a lot of fish species. You're depressing me just asking that question. <laughs> Somebody asked me at lunch today if I wanted to start doing ants, and I said, there is the path to madness. <laughs> no, I have started doing aquatic species. I don't have a lot of them up. I should, I should, but um, ugh, three quarters of the world's covered in salt water, right? Ugh, I'm never going to get this thing done. <laughs> That's true. And you know, eventually the fo donate pictures, the, the photo arc will eventually become a crowdsourced thing and it will become a nonprofit thing someday. But I swore to myself, I started a nonprofit back home called the Grassland Foundation and I'm on the board of Defenders of Wildlife nationally. And I swear that I'm not going to do it until I get a big endowment so that I don't spend all my time chasing the almighty dollar. Because that's all we did with my Grassland thing. That's all we did, so. Yes. Um, we see a lot of the, of the things that are happening on land because we live on land. But how are things under the sea? How are things under the sea? The sea is a mysterious place. But from my, from my friends that do um, underwater work and have for a long time, like Brian Scarry or David Dublay, they have seen the de depletion of ocean stocks in their careers, their short careers by, by geologic time standpoint. 30, 40 years, they've seen a lot of the major fish species go away because of overfishing. We are straining the oceans. So it's kind of rough. We don't know exactly how bad, but they're pretty sure that 90% of a lot of large fish stocks are gone now because we've eaten them. Shark, tuna, that kind of thing. So um, it's kind of rough out there. But things are remarkable in how quickly they'll rebound if we can take some pressure off of them. How about a happy story for a change? Um, <laughs> We bought, and this is not an ocean story, but it has to deal with water. We bought a farm that was just completely dry. It was a cornfield that had a breached um, NRD, Natural Resources District, dam on it. And so it was dry, and it was full of thistles, and it was basically a toxic waste dump. It had been a cornfield and bean field for a lot of years, and lots and lots of chemicals sprayed on it, and it was out in the middle of a mile section. It was way removed from any stream. And we fixed the dam, and it rained heavy a couple weeks later. And we went back out there six weeks later after this rain had filled this pond in what was a cornfield full of chemicals for years. And as we came over the hill, it was at dusk, we saw lots of swallows buzzing the surface of the stream, hunting mosquitoes, dragonflies doing that as well. As we neared the stream, there were frogs everywhere hopping into that pond. There were turtles. I have no idea where they came from. And there was a school of bullheads, little fish in the middle of the pond. And I thought, wow, nature really does abhor a vacuum. It cannot stand a vacuum. When we give nature a little bit of a break, it roars back. It roars back. So I'm very hopeful that if we can ease off and save some big chunks of wilderness, whether it's at the oceans or in forest setting or prairie, nature will come back. It'll find a way to thrive. 
it will, but we have to give it a little bit of a break. We have to, and we should be protecting large chunks of wilderness because it regulates our climate. You know, climate change is about more than just getting hotter. Climate change is about having rains come predictably in areas where we know how to grow food, where people will starve. That's a big thing. As a guy who has a couple of small farms, predictable, timely rains in the right amounts are critical to bringing off crops every year. And if, if we screw up our weather patterns because we deforest all the tropical rainforests around the equator, we're really, really just going to get what we deserve, I'm afraid. That was a long answer to a short question, wasn't it? <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, your, your very short list of uh, some of the best zoos in the U.S. to uh, travel to. Short list of the best zoos in the U.S. Well, Houston Zoo, of course. <laughs> for one, right? That's right. Uh, I, have, I grew up in Omaha, and Omaha has a really good zoo. I, uh, I like the zoos that have been the friendliest to me, of course. If you're, if you're in the, in the uh, Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or AZA, you're a pretty fine zoo. They have a very high standard, and the zoos that I go to generally are. Um, the Lincoln Children's Zoo, um, a lot of the smaller zoos, believe it or not, like the uh, Miller Park Zoo in Bloomington, Illinois, I've been there five or six times because they have good species and I get treated real well and they usually buy me a hamburger at lunch <laughs> on a pretty cheap date. Um, but in terms of really great zoos, I've not been to Singapore yet, but they have four different facilities there that I hear are just outstanding. There's a lot of great zoos out there. If you want to put your, put your uh, name and email on my little mailing list, and put which zoos next to your name, I'll, I'll email you. Speaking of that, I do have a mailing list. I'm going to put a few along the stage with pens if you guys wouldn't mind signing up. And there's also a mailing list uh, that you can join up out on the table, the Houston Zoo table out in the lobby. Anybody have a question way back? Yes, way in the back. I really want, I love your uh, model of social entrepreneurship and this idea of investing back in, you know, creating a business and solving social issues. How would you get all this funding from the zoos? I, I want to do something with wildlife conservation, particularly endangered species. And I have this um, textiles and apparel sort of, this sort of foundation. And I need sponsors, I need funding. Right. How did you go to the zoo? How did National Geographic even do it? You know, how, how did you just how did Geographic do what? How did they get a hold of you? I mean, how did you... You mean the career that I've had up until the photo arc, that type of thing? Well, I mean, there's all this funding, this background, this army, this support. Well, I'm glad you brought that, brought that up. There is no uh, real... I mean, the, the Houston Zoo has supported a, a couple of trips. They're supporting me going with Chris Holmes down to Columbia to do rare birds coming up uh, for three weeks in March. Um, and they funded a trip to Vietnam, which is basically cover the plane ticket, room and board ground transportation, but there, but the funding all comes from talks that I give. There is no, Geographic gives me a fellowship which pays for a few days per quarter, which I'm grateful for, but in terms of the funding, the funding comes from me speaking. I come and do a talk like this, it pays the bills, and then I go to another city, I'm going to Anchorage, Alaska at the end of the week, and that gets me up close to the, Alaska, the Sea Life Center in Seward, where I'm going to photograph some rare birds and fish, or do some fish. <laughs> and, um, but the speaking fees pay for, pay for my four employees and me to pay my bills and to pay for more photo art shoots. The speaking fees that I make. The zoos are not giving me money. There's not any zoos giving me money, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> that part of it. But, you know, we can talk a little bit about that. If you want to come down, we can talk a little bit more. I think that the main thing is that if you, can, if you have a good idea that people believe in, I think they'll invest in it. Crowdsource funding makes that a little easier, although you have to do fulfillment hourly. <laughs> hourly. You can't just wait till the end and send people thank you notes. It doesn't work like that. So it's, it's not as you'd think. This is a self-funded project, basically. And it's powered by speaking engagements, fees that I generate. By, fortunately, I had a 25-year career with National Geographic Magazine, and I've got tons of stories that I can tell to, you know, to tie, back that up. I'm going to Madison, Wisconsin tomorrow to give a talk for National Geographic Live. It's very little photo arc, and instead, you know, it's stories about the time I got the flesh-eating parasite in Bolivia and how, you know, about lost my leg. It's stuff like that that people really want to hear. And they, <laughs> they, pay, they pay for that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Actually, I don't have a question. I have a comment. Yes. I don't know if you remember, I actually helped Joel get that picture. 
And so I just want to say he is a pleasure to work with. And if you can help him out, it's great because we as keepers jump over when you hear Joe's come because we want to work with him so bad. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, I did. I did the Franz Lanting thing for 20 years. I, you know, like you saw a lot of it. It's like, it's a percentage. Now a lot of it's done with camera traps or animals that are not afraid of us, habituated animals in a way, animals that were never scared. Like you see a lot of stories on penguins and albatross because they just were never hunted. And so they're easy to get close to. Uh, the Planet Earth series really changed, changed things. You know, we need to be right there close in the lap of the wildlife, seeing normal behavior lit really well for, with a wide angle lens right there. A, long, a 600 millimeter shot, you know, in the wild, like it's tougher to sell. It's tougher to, to get into geographic. But in terms of uh, publishing success, I'd say one in 1500 frames would make it into the magazine. One in 1200, that's probably a pretty fair average. Yeah, yeah, but been there, done that for a long time. Yes, sir. Hey, Joel, so uh, do you have any skills either acquired or natural that you'd say really help perpetuate your career and perpetuate your cause that are not directly linked to your technical skill as a photographer? I'm not technically that proficient compared to a lot of people, I don't think. Uh, what helped me was being on the right corner when the bus went by. And that is, I had a sense of humor and I started out shooting people pictures that were kind of funny. And I got my job with Geographic actually by uh, meeting a Geographic photographer after a talk he'd given, like this. And, um, and uh, I got an interview and I was uh, so stressed about that interview. I hadn't slept in a couple days and I got a terrible cold. And I'd flown back there and it was my big break. And I felt really terrible, a throbbing headache. And I remember it was raining that day. And I remember the, the director of photography then opening his mail because we didn't have email back then. It was like 1988. He was opening his mail. He forgot I was this little slumpy guy on his couch in his office. He forgot I was even there. It was that bad. <laughs> and towards the end of the interview, he said, uh, he looked up and said, oh, why should I hire you? And I said, I don't know. I, I don't like people much, and I hate to travel, to be honest with you. I was just honest. And I meant I didn't like crowds much. But that's why I said to him. And years later, you know, he and I got to be pretty good friends. And I asked him why he hired me. And I told him, reminded him of that. And he said, because I asked that question of everybody that had ever come into my, into my office. And they all said, with the exception of you, you should hire me because I love people and I love to travel. And he said, I was not looking to hire somebody to have a good time on my nickel. <laughs> that's it. He said, I knew you'd do your job and get home to your wife, and that's just what you did. So, yes, sir. Uh, can you speak about the, the challenge, either photographically or storytelling, of connecting local wildlife with global wildlife, especially when you see things like planet Earth and getting people to value what's local? That's tougher, isn't it? In North America, we have a lot of brown animals. You know, the cardinal is our showiest bird. Yeah, it's a, little, it's a little bit tougher when people are used to seeing these fabulous spectacles of nature, you know, the wildebeest migration and the crocs pulling them into the Mara River, and it's tough to see that around here. Um, it, it is tough. I think it comes from having a basic understanding of what you have and valuing that. Like, we teach a lot of prairie education back home, and prairies are very quiet until you know what's going on and you can really see it. I think having kids out there with nets and scooping walking sticks up out of grass or butterflies or whatever they can sain out of the grass is a great experience, but you have, it's hands-on. Touch is such a powerful thing. I think getting kids to, it starts very young. It's very hard to get somebody that's not, that's not been steeped in this all along to all of a sudden get really jazzed about an Atwater's Prairie Chicken, for example. I think it has to start very young and they have to appreciate everything, all forms, even little minnows that live naturally in a stream. How do they survive in this year round? You have to, you have to show them that even, even plants that grow up through cracks in the highway, what we would call weeds, they're the most resilient, remarkable things on the face of the earth. Could you be run over 20,000 times a day and still bloom? <laughs> That's remarkable. We have to tell them good stories. We have to hook them with good stories. But that's very deep within us, the need to connect with storytelling. I think that's a big deal.
I think that's a big deal. But it is tough. You know, we do not have we do not have big crocodiles here. You know, we just don't. Yes, sir. How are the photographs archived for posterity? That's a great question. I should have answered that better. Um, Geographic is archiving everything back at, at their headquarters in DC in perpetuity. They also distribute the work and market the work. And um, so future generations probably will value this more than we do because we're seeing a lot of these things live and still don't care enough. Future generations might see it and, uh, differently. You know, they might see it differently because you know, the, fo the, the photographic record of what's extinct already is poor, very poor. Peter sent me a book uh, not long after we got back from Vietnam. It's remarkable. It's, the, it's extinction in the photographic record is what it's called. You, they show you a lot of these animals that have gone, and they are really not documented well. It's hard to even see them. It's hard to even see them. And for a lot of the pheasants at Don Butler's, for example, he showed me the best pictures of these pheasants, and they were drawings by Gould from the 1800s. They were paintings. That's what they use to identify, basically to show people what these birds look like. It's, it's shocking and, and pathetic. And Gould was a great artist, but we should have magnificent photographic records of these animals, especially if they're just on the cusp of extinction. I mean, that one guy had... 10% of the world's populations of Edwards pheasants in his backyard cages. 10% of that bird found in Vietnam. Not in Vietnam anymore, actually, extinct in the wild. Yes? Uh, well, how am I prioritizing what I'm photographing? I've been, I've been doing it very haphazardly in that I go to a, if I'm invited to speak at the Alaska Forum, great. What does the Anchorage Zoo have? What does the Alaska Sea Life Center have? Right? If I'm invited to speak at the Asia Society, great. Peter, what do you guys have down here? Call Peter and Renee and Chris. What do you guys have new since the last time I was there? So that's how I've been doing it. Um, I'm trying to do more specialty trips. Like, there's a lady that, a private lady has a little zoo in her backyard in Libreville, Gabon, and she has the only African golden cat in captivity. And I've got to get out there. I've got to get to her. And so I'm going to do a crowdsource funding thing to try to go on that trip to get there and get it. Because when that's gone, is there, will there be another one in my lifetime or anybody's lifetime? Don't know. Maybe not. It's the only one. So I need to hurry up. I'm, prior, I'm prioritizing based on rarity when I can, but I can only crowdsource fund one trip a year maybe. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. So who else? These are really good questions, actually. Yes? Do you have a trick for getting the shot? I, I work with animals and do pet photography. Photos like that are really a trick to getting the shot. And that's through big chain mesh, too. It's through big chain. Um, the trick to getting the shot is having a lot of bananas and, a, and somebody who's really good with them that they trust and having them come up and wait like that. And that's actually an adoptive mom, right? It's not even her biological mom. Um, the, basically, it's work really quickly, really quickly, and do no harm. You know, you don't want to kill anything. We haven't done that yet. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, but mainly it's just up against my face and trying to uh, hurry up. Maybe a lot of times, especially with a bigger animal, if we're using a background that can be destroyed, uh, it's, it happens in the first five or ten seconds and that's it. Paint. Paint is a better way to go. If they can paint an off-exhibit space white or black, that's a much better way to go than paper, obviously, for chimps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we really try to watch that. Props, oh, squeaky things. I can squeal like a pig once in a while, and that'll get their attention for a second, but, but not. You know, I should, I, should put, I should get squeakers and stuff, shouldn't I? I've, I've always shied away from that, though, because I see how baby photographers work, and that's one step away from that. So. <laughs> that's the hardest subject to shoot. Babies are really tough. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes? Uh, well, you know, I shoot, I don't have a camera sponsor, but I shoot with Nikon because that's what I grew up using and they're sealed up pretty good against dirt and moisture. They can take a pounding pretty much, you know, they can be dropped sometimes and still work. Um, so I, I use Nikon D4s and uh, uh, standard assortment of lenses, some ma a couple of macros and uh, 24 to 70 is basically my favorite lens. And, and I use um, Dyna lights or um, Ellen Chrome lights, whichever is lighter. I have to watch how much baggage I take and which airline I'm flying with, because if they want to ding me for an extra hundred dollars, that's a lot. So I take a smaller light set. You know, it just depends. It's all very budget conscious. 
Yes. Oh yeah, the Blackfish movie. You know, I, I uh, the pin, my, what's my opinion of SeaWorld with the movie Blackfish? I think that that movie's damaged the zoo industry somewhat because it makes zoos look bad. But I'm telling you, it, for people that have a problem with zoos, they are the keepers of the kingdom now. There's a lot of species that you saw in this show that do not exist in the wild anymore. Zoos are only, the only thing keeping them going. So in terms of those, those animals, now this is just my opinion. This is my opinion, and a lot of people would take umbrage with this. I believe that we need to see animals in person. I believe that we are not going to care about anything unless we fall in love with it. I think we're going to strain all the fish out of the sea and cut down every last tree, just like in the Lorax, unless people figure out a reason to care and fall in love with it. And I think those animals connect people and make them fall in love with whether it's orcas or dolphins or whatever. And, you know, I've gotten in lots of arguments with people about this, but they're sacrificial in a way. And they are good for keeping the public coming in and keeping them engaged. It can't all be on the computer. We have to get out and see animals in person or we will be lost ourselves. Well, you know what happens when you lose 50% of all species? And it does not have to be this way. You know what happens when the public completely disengages with the natural world and thinks you think that all your food comes from the grocery store and your water just comes out of the tap? You know what happens when we get to that point when we don't realize that we are part of it? We go down too. We go like this. So I, I think that if we can hook people in with the bigger charismatic species, they're going to think about what's going on in the ocean. They're going to think about what's, what's going on in the ocean. They're going to think about eating seafood. They'll think twice about what species they eat. I think that it leads to bigger things. We need that. I think we need that because we don't care enough. So I think that they are just, you know, as long as they're cared for well, this is how it is. This is how it is. And it's needed. I think it's needed. Vitally needed. So, And I, you know, the movie has some valid points. I thought it was about twice as long as it needed to be. And it was amazing seeing that guy gasp for air as the killer whale held him. I thought, you know, there's some amazingly sensationalistic footage in it. I'm glad I watched it. Didn't change my opinion about zoos or SeaWorld a bit. I'm a huge fan of zoos. Huge fan. And if you'd seen literally species sucked back from the brink, the species I showed, down to fewer than two dozen each, saved by zoos and captive breeding centers. Huge fan. Yes, sir. First camera was a little Nikon FM2 that I paid extra to get in black because I thought that was cool and the chicks would dig it. <laughs> they did not. <laughs> you have a yes. Two, two things touch upon. Could you guys hear that in the back? Probably not. Um, so two things touch upon. The sense of touch is really powerful, and it is huge. The sense of touch. Even just sitting in the splash zone in the front of you know Shamu's tank and getting wet, I remember that from when I was eight years old, my parents taking me to SeaWorld. That was amazing, right? Seeing these giant animals leap in the air. It was an amazing thing. So the sense of touch, being able to touch animals in either a zoo educational program or just getting kids out and letting them get muddy in a pond or a stream or a tidal pool, those are big deals. Um, and the other thing, just in terms of how do we get this message out to schools, I would love to hear your advice. I would love to get your input. That'd be great. I would love to see somebody promote this as an educational tool in schools. But we're, my staff is a year behind me in working these pictures. 
We have every animal on a black and white background, but they poop a lot, ducks especially. Um, they drag dirt and mud on these backgrounds. So we darken the backgrounds to black and we brighten them to white. That takes a while. We just do, we don't move animals around. We don't move pixels around. They're all the real thing, but we, we clean those backgrounds up and then we have to keyword them and send them to geographic. And my staff's a year behind me. We have four people. And so we have not had time to develop all these wonderful things you're talking about, like developing school programs or games or puzzles or interactive. We haven't had the time. We don't have the capacity. I would love it if somebody here was some video game designer and they're like, I think we could make this big. I would love that. I would love it. So it's not just financial help we need. It's like anything you can dream up. That's the whole goal is to get people to care while there's still time to save all this stuff. So, yes. Do you license your images for coffee cups, t-shirts, billboards? We do license the images, yes. But believe it or not, I photographed 740 species of snake Nobody's ever once come to me wanting the license picture of a snake. <laughs> the majority of what the people want, they want polar bears, tigers, rhinos, a little, elephants, gorillas. Uh, that's what people want. People want the big charismatic species, not so much everything else, which is what the photo arc looks at is everything else. So it's a matter of, um, again, just trying to get the word out. And eventually people will hopefully pick it up. And people are starting to pick it up. I mean, the, the, this is going to be in the movie The Sixth Extinction by Luis Sahoyo, the same guy that did The Cove, the dolphin slaughter documentary, which was an amazing film. Uh, he's doing one that just premiered at Sundance, and, the, and I'm in it for like five minutes, and maybe that'll give it a lift. Geographic uses, the pic uses these pictures now nearly every issue. But we're talking about needing to create a sea change in public opinion towards our relationship with wildlife. This is one tool to do that. We really, truly do need to have a, a broader change and a broader understanding and, pa and compassion of how we fit into the environment and what we take out of the environment, our consumer choices especially. There needs to be that kind of a dialogue. And in the last presidential election, in any of the presidential debates, there was not one question about an environmental issue. Candy Crowley was posed one during her CNN debate uh, about climate change, I think, but she didn't forward it to the candidates because she didn't think anybody would care. And she's right. She was right. I think things are changing more and more. I'm just hoping that people wise up and will start to care before the skies fall, that kind of thing, right? But they won't because we care. So that's, does anybody have one last question that's more positive than that sad <laughs> note? Fire away, young man. <laughs> I would love volunteers to help me. Why don't you put your email right on this list? <laughs> Thank you, folks. Come on down if you have any questions. Hey, you got stuff to sign?